Here I am. Good morning. Happy 4th of July. Uh, we welcome you here in person. We welcome you here online for everybody that's joining us online at Central Christian Church this morning. Lincoln Log Cabin, Lerna, Illinois. Not only did Abraham Lincoln never live there, but the original cabin, the cabin that he helped his father Thomas build, was taken apart later. It was transported to Chicago in 1892 for the Columbian Exposition, which was delayed by a year, and then the cabin pieces were mysteriously lost and nobody knows where they are. Enter a young married couple driving across Illinois on vacation, and they see a sign advertising Lincoln Log Cabin, hot tourist attraction. So they go off the beaten path to the area outside of Lerna, Illinois, to see this fascinating piece of U.S. history. The brochure promotes it with a picture of Abe and this tagline, Lincoln Log Cabin, where 1845 comes alive. Not only did we find that Abraham Lincoln had never lived there, only his father and stepmother had lived there. Not only did we find that the original cabin had been lost in Chicago since 1892, we also found out that the replica of it, which was not a restoration of it that was there on that location, was being renovated that day so we really couldn't even see it. <laughs> so that day we were disappointed to learn that we couldn't see a restored cabin that wasn't an actual restoration but an attempted copy of the cabin that Lincoln had never lived in but rarely had visited and was now lost. If you happen to be traveling near Lerna, Illinois, and you see the sign that says Lincoln Log Cabin, I've told you so. <laughs> Just stay on the highway. There are a lot of entities today <clears throat> that are claiming to offer restoration in life, flood restoration, hair restoration, financial restoration. There's even a company that does reputation restoration today. And there are some who are claiming to restore your hope, your sense of well-being, your confidence in the government. A lot of promising, wonderful restoration, but they're not all genuine. Have you noticed that? This morning, we are going to be in the midst of celebrating what we have in our nation, also talking about real restoration that we need in our lives. Just a moment, Tim is going to come and read to us from God's Word. Good morning. <clears throat> Reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with a harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed instrument. Sing to him a new song. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. And the earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts them into deep storehouses. Let the, Lord fear, let the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all the generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he chose for his inheritance. From the heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all of mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all the earth who live, all who live on the earth, he, he who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything that they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, 
to deliver them from the death and keep them alive in famine. We wait and hope for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for he trusts in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Will you go ahead and stand as we sing of God's great faithfulness?
one of one place I really enjoy visiting is the Henry Ford Museum and Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, a couple family trips I went there as a youngster, and several years ago, Kay and I uh, visited there. There's one area in the Greenfield Village called Liberty Craft Works, uh, and in that area, there are you know, various craftsmen, obviously, <laughs> and we visited around glass blowing, and we spent a lot of time in the in the potter's uh, shop. They're watching as the potter takes a, a lump of clay, you know, mud, uh, essentially, and with his wheel, patiently and with skill, changes, shapes, molds that lump of clay into what will become a, a beautiful earthen vessel. Fascinating process to watch and an image that God uses in his word uh, several times. One is in Jeremiah where, where God tells the prophet, go to the potter's house and there I will uh, I'll speak to you. So Jeremiah says, I, I, I went to, down to the potter's house, there he was, making something on the wheel, but the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. And God goes on to explain to Jeremiah how the lump of clay is like Israel, and, and can I not make into Israel a, a vessel that I want it to be if it is, if I say to a nation I want to destroy it and that nation turns from its evil, uh, can I not relent and not bring calamity on that nation? Or if I promise to bless a nation and that nation turns toward evil, can I not uh, bring calamity then on that nation? And that's how it is with Israel. Israel became imperfect because of their sin and God remolded them, always with the hope and the goal of restoring Israel, making them to be a vessel that is useful. Uh, to him, the prophet Isaiah in chapter 65 recognizes, and use this, this same image again, he recognizes sin as the problem with Israel. Behold, you were angry, for we sinned. Shall we be saved, he asked, for all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. But now, O Lord, verse 8, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. I think this image can be helpful for us as we pause to remember Jesus, uh, take communion at this time. And, and this image really is used in the New Testament as well, but we, were, we are, are like clay in God's hands, and when we chose sin, we became flawed, imperfect, spoiled in the potter's hand. God could have just thrown that lump away, but but his goal, his hope, is always to restore, uh, to remake. So he decided to, to do the work, to pay the price through Jesus on Calvary, to be able to reshape us, remake us into vessels that are beautiful and useful to him. And that's what we pause to remember now uh, during this time of communion with the bread that is Jesus' body, the fruit of the vine, his blood. That was the price Jesus, that God paid, Jesus paid for us to be able to restore us. You know, that image makes its way into some of our songs 
but I think provide a good thought for us now as we spend some quiet time thinking about Jesus in communion, the hymn, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, Have Thine Own Way. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting, yielded and still. One that's a little newer, uh, you are the potter, I am the clay, mold me and make me, this is what I pray, change my heart, O oh God, make it ever new, change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Good thoughts as we pause to remember Jesus. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, uh, what a blessing that you are a God that chooses to restore, uh, to remake rather than to throw away. And as we pause in this quiet moment to remember what you did for us through Jesus on Calvary, how he died uh, in our place, how he bore uh, the sins of all of us in his eternal being, paying the eternal price for our sin so that you can make us new. Father, as we ponder that, as we take the bread, as we drink the fruit of the vine and remember, um, I pray that you would do the words of that song. Make our hearts new. May we be like you. And Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> During uh, offering time, I'll remind you once again, and those of you online, you can give uh, multiple ways. And yes, if you're an elementary student, you can go to your class now. You can put your offering in the black box in the back there. You can mail it to the church address here, 6595 Guilford Road, or give online at cccrockford.org. We've showed you several uh, video clips of ministries that Central works with and supports. Uh, I believe the newest ministry that we have partnered with is called E2, Effective Elders. And we have a video uh, to show you on that, and then I'll say a few words after the video. Hey, good morning, friends there at Central Christian Church, Rockford, Illinois. We are so grateful to you for a partnership. My name is Dr. Gary Johnson, and I serve as the executive director of E2 Effective Elders. 
And uh, we have been blessed by all of you at Central Christian Church with the gift of a partnership. What that means is your elders have uh, drawn alongside all of us here at E2, and, and here our offices are in Indianapolis at Indian Creek Christian Church, the creek on the south side of Indianapolis. You've reached out to us, established a partnership so that we can reach elders literally across the country and around the world. Your gifts to E2 enable us, here's our vision statement, to equip elders to lead. And it's happening literally, not only locally, not only nationally, but globally. You enable us to produce materials, training materials for elders of churches. I served for 40 years as a preacher, 30 of those years here at the Creek in Indianapolis. And during these recent years, two friends of mine, Dr. Jim Easter and Dr. David Rodka, prompted by the Holy Spirit, the three of us founded E2. This month, June of 2021, is our ninth anniversary of becoming a 501c3 not-for-profit religious organization. And uh, God, in these recent years, has enabled us to produce many books. As a matter of fact, we have over 60,000 in circulation already in five foreign languages and soon to be a sixth foreign language. Our books are being used around the world. And moreover, uh, the Lord has enabled us to meet with over 9,000 elders and church leaders in only our conferences that meet on the campuses, for example, of Lincoln Christian University, or Ozark Christian College, or Johnson University in Tennessee, as well as in Florida, our many schools. And you enable us to continue to spread this great ministry of encouragement and equipping. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, we had an email from Ghana Christian University and College in West Africa. Ghana Christian uh, University is a school of ours, that of the Restoration Movement. And a senior lecturer there uh, with a PhD has contacted us to provide them with material to help train elders in Ghana, West Africa. That's off the chart incredible. And because of your partnership, we continue to be able to provide leadership training of elders the world over. We cannot thank you enough for the partnership. Thank you for believing in what we do and for walking beside us in equipping elders who will lead well. God's blessing rests on you at Central Christian Church in Rockford, Illinois. So in this time that is really a critical time for uh, church leaders, elders to lead well, uh, our partnership with E2, Effective Elders, has a couple benefits really. Similar to the way we support the ministry of Rio Bravo Christian Mission and also have the benefit of going there and being part of short-term mission trip, our support of E2 also has benefit to us in that our elders are receiving some coaching coaching <laughs> uh, to help us uh, be able to lead well in these difficult times. So thank you for your continued faithful giving that allows us to uh, not only support the work of E2 and ministries like E2, but benefit uh, from them. Uh, let me just have a quick prayer. Father, we are so grateful for the many ways you so generously pour out blessing to us and what a blessing it is for us uh, to focus on giving giving back to you and uh, so thank you for this time and this the few minutes we've had uh, to recognize the faithful giving of these people and to realize how important it is for us to give like you give to us we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
I thank uh, Tom for sharing about that this morning. Uh, one of the things that what he's talking about means is this, church family. Our elders want to do a good job. Aren't you glad for that? And that's the point of that, especially, is they're working hard to do a good job leading. And so I appreciate uh, our partnership with a group that's helping that to happen as well. I, I think you should know that, that they're good men who want to do a good job. Today we are starting a short series of messages centering on an important event in Israel's history, their restoration from exile and the restoration, the rebuilding of the temple. The main place we're going to learn about that is in the book of Ezra, which is all part of a very interesting and important history. But more importantly, we're going to be looking at another restoration, your restoration. And my restoration, not just to a better life, but restoration to a real life. So we're titling this, Real Life Restored. Thought that'd be good on the heels of a pandemic lockdown. And uh, not just that, but some other ways that restoration is so important in our lives. So yes, we're in the Old Testament. You can find the book of Ezra about one-third into your Bible. So open up your Bible. If you go about one-third into it, Ezra's tucked away in there right before Nehemiah. And we're not going to be just in Ezra. It is going to take us this journey through Second Chronicles, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and a bunch of the New Testament, to name a few. And all along the way, we're going not just to take a look at the Bible, but we are also going to learn how to look at it, how to understand and apply it in our lives. Ezra is going to be a great place to do that. One of the things we're going to see is how the Bible fits together and needs to be studied as a whole. Today of all days, that's important. July the 4th, here it is on Sunday. One of the mistakes that I often hear people making is taking some event out of the history of Israel or some prophecy of the Bible that is directed at Israel and then psh, drawing a straight line to the United States. It's important to remember Israel is unique in God's covenant. Our nation is unique in a lot of wonderful ways, isn't it? That's an amen spot right there. Yeah, it is. It's wonderful and it's unique. Uh, in fact, you're unique in a lot of wonderful ways. But we're relatively, as a nation, quite young. And we're not unique to God's plan in the same way that God chose the nation of Israel from the very start. So we're going through Israel or through Ezra, and we're going to make the effort to apply that to ourselves in the right way. That's going to be challenging sometimes. Are you up for it? All right. Hang on for the next weeks. We'll be working on that. Here's the second thing you'll see, and that is that the Bible fits into our lives but we need to be willing to discover the way that it applies to each of us. Let me tip my cards right now. Here it is in one paragraph, everything that's going to happen here this morning. The history highlighted in Ezra gives us a good comparison of our own failures and God's restoration that we desperately need. We could say the same of ourselves as a nation. Maybe we could say the same as uh, a church in the world right now, but when we start talking about making the nation better or making the church better, that all kind of sounds theoretical, doesn't it? The nation should change. The church should change. What makes up a nation? What makes up a church? You do. I do. That would be us. So the bottom line is, we've messed up. Despite God's warnings, we reap the results of that in life. And at the same time, God has very compassionately offered to us also a restoration, real restoration, that everybody needs. Something else that we're going to discover as we're doing this is how the Bible fits into history. That it is about real times, real people, real places that really exist. The book of Ezra highlights two characters, both of whom serve as governors of Jerusalem for a short time. The first one, hang on, is Zerubbabel. 
You may as well go ahead and get comfortable saying it, all right? Zerubbabel. Here we go. Let's try it. Zerubbabel. Just think of Barney Rubble, and you got it, all right? Zerubbabel. He is the main mover and shaker for the first six chapters of the book of Ezra. Ezra doesn't even get named and introduced until chapter 7, 60 years into it. Now, Ezra was a priest and a scribe, apparently a very significant person in Israel's history here. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as time goes by. We're also going to be talking about nations like Babylon and Persia, kings like Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, and Darius, prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Haggai, Zechariah, and real-life events like moving to Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the altar, rereading God's Word. And in the midst of all of this, we're going to see a story about the restoration of a nation of their residency, of their worship to God, their purity, their obedience to God's commands. So get used to that word too, restoration. Because let's face it, you and I, we're surrounded by the need for restoration, aren't we? Three points I'd like to share with you this morning after studying through, pouring through Ezra, and I think that we can draw out of it today. The first one is this. Restoration means there has been a breakdown. Restoration means there has been a breakdown. Last December, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, everything a mess. Here at Central, uh, here we were juggling, trying to go, all right, when can we get back together? When can we quit watching church on TV every Sunday morning and get back together. And we saw Christmas Eve as a good opportunity, a good time to do that. So we started working towards that. All right, Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve, we're going to get together. We're going to have worship together. And that's going to preview what's coming up in July of 2021. So about four days before Christmas Eve, while all of us are working hard to get ready for it, my computer decides to die a slow and painful death. The hard drive crashed. Had to have it replaced. And then that meant replacing the, the OS, the operating system for you non-nerds. And all the programs and data that needed to be put back on it, they needed to be restored. Now, that was not my first choice of things to have happen just a few days before Christmas. And I needed Rob, the tech guy, to dig me out of that one. I wouldn't have needed Rob's help if there hadn't been a breakdown. Something went wrong. Think about this. The reason that there is a story in the book of Ezra about the Jews returning to Jerusalem is because... They were removed from there. The reason that there is a story there about the rebuilding of the temple is because the temple was destroyed. The reason in Nehemiah that there is the ongoing story of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem is because those walls were torn down. Israel was defeated and exiled. Pictured it's Oh, 576 B.C., a real time in history. And an imaginary little Jewish boy living somewhere in Babylon asks his dad, Father, I hear stories about Jerusalem and about how wonderful our nation used to be. Why aren't we there? Why do we live so far away from it now? Why don't we have a land to call our own? In other words... Asking the question, how do we end up in exile? And that father would probably share with his son how after Solomon, Israel became a divided kingdom for 344 years, and then he would probably go to the end of Second Chronicles and begin to share with him the summary of the end of Israel. Chapter 36, verse 11. 
Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. In other words, the nation's leader, the king, turned his heart against the Lord. That's the first reason. Read on in verse 14. All the officers of the priests and the people, likewise, were exceedingly unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations. And they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. So add to the king's rebellion the rebellion of the religious leaders. And did you pick up on it? And it said, and the people likewise. They adopted the culture around them rather than changing the culture they were in. They desecrated the temple. Even in the midst of all that going on in Israel, God gave them a way back. Verse 15, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no Remedy. Sometimes I hear people speaking about God of the Old Testament, how he is somehow less loving, less patient, less kind than God in the New Testament. You know what? The Old Testament is full of God giving Israel second chances, full of God being rejected by them. That is is why Israel is in exile. That's why the next word is therefore. Verse 17, therefore, he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand, and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes. All these he brought to Babylon. They burned the house of God, and broke down the wall of Jerusalem, and burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious vessels. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons, until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths, all the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. It's interesting to me how these last two paragraphs in the book of Second Chronicles are repeated in the first paragraphs of the book of, guess what? Ezra. To understand Ezra, you have to understand why Israel is in exile. Why? Because they turned their hearts against the Lord. How do we end up in exile? That's the answer. Have you ever asked that question when things seem to go terribly wrong here and now? I'm guessing that we should. I'm guessing that we should ask that question because God goes to great lengths to spell it out for the people of Judah. Here's why you're in exile. Once in a while, I'll get asked about the back story, the backdrop of Central Christian Church. What, where did Central Christian Church come from? What is the Christian Church all about? How did we come to be? I want to tell you this morning, we at Central Christian Church are part of a group of churches that grew from a unity effort over 200 years ago, over 220 years ago. People clear back then saw the damage and the disunity that having different denominations was doing to the church, and they wanted to get back to being one body, to being just Christians, instead of people taking on extra names to separate themselves. 
And they wanted to use the Bible only to be Christians only. That movement, that movement to restore the church to the unity that Jesus wanted for it, its intended oneness became known as the Restoration Movement. I happen to agree with the whole idea as something that honors Jesus' prayer in John 17. Here's the point, though. The reason there needs to be a restoration is because something went wrong. And that's not just the history of the church. That's your personal history and mine too. Something went wrong. Paul alludes to this in Ephesians 2, verse 19. He says to the Christians in Ephesus, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Isn't that great news? Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? People who were once all separated, who were scattered, who were exiled, all being brought together to be made into something wonderful. But the reason that that needs to happen is because something has broken down. Church, the message that we have to share with the world that there is a Savior who died on our behalf, that God is inviting you to be restored to him, that message doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless it's true that something has gone terribly wrong. Amen? There has been a breakdown. Think it through. Isn't that why you're here this morning? Not because everything in life is hunky-dory, <laughs> but because something's wrong. We're here because we're trying to get something back. Something has been broken, has been lost, has come apart. It needs to be fixed, found, rebuilt, restored. We understand that. So here we are. Here's something else to learn about restoration. It means there's been a breakdown. It also is personal and is also about ownership. When we talk about restoration, we could be talking about one of two things. First of all, to restore something means to return someone or something to an original or former state or condition, right? Take something, restore it. Make it like it was. There's a second meaning to the word, the way that we use it. And that is to ensure that something is returned to the proper or rightful person, right? To restore it to its owner. Now, number two is what the Lord especially has in mind for you and me. It has shades of number one in it. The whole of creation, the scriptures tell us, is going to be restored and that's going to take an extreme makeover to get it there. But the end result of that is going to be a new heaven, a new earth. It won't be exactly like the original. It'll be better. But when we talk about the Lord restoring us, it's especially in the sense of returning something to its rightful owner. You can take an old car that has been neglected, spent a lot of time and money on it. <laughs> if you've ever done that, you know what I'm talking about. And you can restore it to look and run like it did originally. I have always liked to talk to the car owners in our car shows here and to hear the restoration stories about their cars. A lot of them, their faces light up and they begin to tell you about restoring their cars. There's a lot of satisfaction, and there's a lot of pride in that accomplishment to take an old beater that looks rough and to bring it back to life and make it look like it did when it was brand new. 
But imagine if a car has been stolen and abused, beaten up, and it's found many years later, and that car is brought back to its original owner, and then he takes that beaten up car, and he gives it some tender loving care, and he gets it back to how it was before. Folks, that is restoration. When we talk about being restored to God, it's not just about God changing our condition. It's also about God getting back what is rightfully his in the first place. The story of restoration isn't all about us. It's about God who created us, from whom we have been separated, getting us back like a lost sheep being restored to the flock or like a runaway son coming home. We do well to keep in mind God wasn't just returning his people to Jerusalem just for their sake. He was putting them there to carry out his plans. The rest of scripture tells us that's God's intention concerning us to get us back to where we belong, not just for our sake, but for him. Restoration is not just about being changed. It's about ownership. Here's something else I think you need to bear in mind as we keep talking about restoration, and that is that restoration is a cooperative effort. Start reading in the book of Ezra. I encourage you, by the way, start reading and read through Ezra this week, okay? Read through Ezra. And you'll see that not all of the people who are in exile return to Jerusalem all at once. About 50,000 of them return in 536 B.C. along with Zerubbabel. Go ahead and say his name. It'll keep you awake. Zerubbabel. There were many more thousands who returned later. Restoration was voluntary. It was a cooperative thing, and the people did it as their hearts stirred in them. It's July the 4th. George Washington, father of our country. George Washington's story is full of amazing military prowess, physical stamina, outstanding statesmanship and character. But there was something about Washington, and history confirms it, that broke down in his life. You know what I'm talking about? His teeth. No kidding. George Washington lost his first tooth at age 25, and he continued to lose his teeth even though he tried to take good care of them. By age 57, he was wearing full dentures. He had, by the way, five different sets of dentures eventually in his lifetime. They weren't quite as good as the ones that get made now. He even saved a couple of his teeth that he lost in Mount Vernon and sent a note to his cousin asking him to mail those teeth to him in New York so that they could be worked into a new pair of dentures that was being built for him by his go-to dentist, Dr. John Greenwood. Yes, those are actual pictures of his dentures. You wouldn't smile either. <laughs> Needless to say... President Washington had to work together with Dr. Greenwood to help restore his bite the best that he could. Ouch. The process of restoration is often a cooperative thing. It takes a restorer and it takes a willingness to be restored. Psalm 51. King David is pouring out his heart to God after being confronted with the depth of his sins. It starts out, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. And in the midst of his pleas, he asks God, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Now, Read through that psalm and you'll see that God is helping David with that. But 
on David's part, it took some repenting. It took some remorse. It took some determination to be restored to God by David before it could happen. Israel as a nation was blessed by God, messed up despite his warnings, reaped the results of that, and then Israel was graciously given this opportunity that we read about in Ezra to return, rebuild, be restored. Now let's talk about us for a minute and wrap this up. Okay? Like a car that needs restoration, like teeth, like a temple, you name it, the fact that there is a restoration planned for us tells us something about our status spiritually. We have been created by God. And since Genesis 3, collectively, we have been messing it up. Despite his warnings, we have reaped the results of that, and then we have graciously now been given the opportunity to return, rebuild, and be restored. It is a cooperative effort. God's not going to force it on anybody. He's made the offer to restore anyone who will accept it. Have you considered that? January of 1833, the U.S. Supreme Court finalized a case called the United States versus George Wilson. Three years before, George Wilson, James Porter, both uh, were partners in crime. They were indicted on six counts for robbing the mail trains and endangering the life of the mail driver in the process. Porter pleaded not guilty, thought he would beat it. He was found convicted and hanged. Wilson changed his plea, <laughs> good move, to guilty. And he was due to be hanged, but in June of 1830, President Andrew Jackson issued a presidential pardon to Wilson. It freed him from death by hanging. He would have only had to serve 20 years in prison. But on October the 21st of that year, get this, Wilson refused to accept the pardon. History doesn't record for us exactly why he did that, just that he rejected it. The said defendant, the case reads, answered in person that he had nothing to say, that he did not wish in any manner to avail himself in order to avoid sentence in this particular case of the pardon referred to. Chief Justice John Marshall wrote this. A pardon is a deed to the validity of which delivery is essential, and delivery is not complete without acceptance. It may then be rejected by the person to whom it is tendered, and if it be rejected, we have discovered no power in a court to force it on him. It may be supposed that no being condemned to death would reject a pardon, but the rule must be the same in capital cases and in misdemeanors. In other words, once a pardon is offered, it's up to the person being pardoned to receive it. Nobody can force a pardon to be received. Even if that person has been sentenced to death, it is still up to him to accept a pardon that has been extended to him or else his death sentence remains. That's just kind of crazy, isn't it? It's kind of what the Supreme Court had to say about the whole thing. It's kind of crazy. But the fact remained, George Wilson wasn't pardoned from his sentence. Refuse a pardon. That sounds crazy. That is exactly the position of every person who doesn't receive Jesus Christ. Sentence stands issued. A pardon has been offered. Salvation is effective only when it is received. What will you do with that? See, the only way that a nation can be saved 
is one person at a time. That's how it works. It's up to every individual person. God has offered salvation through his son to every person who's willing to accept it. A pardon, a restoration to real life through Jesus Christ. This morning, if you haven't accepted that yet, then you're on the same level there with a guy named Wilson who had a presidential pardon and said, nope, don't want it. Why would anybody say that? You have an opportunity today while you're drawing breath to receive real life from Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and that's what you want, we have an opportunity here in just a moment. I'm going to step down here. I'm going to be down front. We're going to be wrapping up our time of worship. And I want you to come visit with me, please, about your relationship to the Lord and what it means to be a follower of Jesus, how you can have assurance of that pardon in your life. If you're joining us online this morning, then we'd love to hear from you. We don't want you to just be done and click on to the next thing and go on with your day. We want to hear from you. So please contact us, cccrockford.org slash connect. Contact us by phone, by email. Get in touch with us. Begin a dialogue. Hear from us. Hear from God's word. What are the next steps to being a follower of Christ? Let's stand together as our worship team gets ready to come and, and lead us in a song, and let's pray together. Father, thank you for a story of restoration, a story that provided great hope and healing for your people who were ready to listen and to turn to you. And a story that gives us great hope. A reminder, Lord, that in our own lives, we've stepped away from you. In our own obstinance, we have turned a deaf ear toward your commands and your desires. And you're calling us back giving us the opportunity to be in fellowship with you once again. Thank you for making that possible, Lord. Thank you that we have your word to see it in, and we have this day the opportunity to come to life in you. Father, please take away the obstacles that would keep anybody from making that decision today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we, as we close out today's service and we head out those doors to go partake in all the festivities of today's holiday, may we not only focus on the freedoms that have been given to us by the lives that have been sacrificed, but may we focus on the ultimate freedom that only comes from Jesus. Jesus is the one who gives us the victory. And may we focus on that today. And you are more than welcome to come forward today and claim that victory for yourself. Let's go ahead and sing. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atonement then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me.
Don't have much else to say after that. Let's pray. Father, it is uh, our thanks to you that we express now, that you invite us to share in your victory, that you won at Calvary, uh, that was capitalized with an empty tomb, and that now we live in day to day. Father, I pray uh, as a church family, as members of our community, as people who have neighbors and friends, co-workers, uh, fellow students, just people who are around us from day to day, that you'll make it show on our faces that we've been with you, that our lives are different because of you, and that we don't find ourselves above anybody, but rejoice uh, that we have found the relationship in you that promises us life, real restoration. Father, may that message uh, go with us from this place. You've commissioned us to take it. So please help us to see the doors that you open up in front of us this week, the windows of opportunity, the, the places where you're going to put us, sometimes awkward and uncomfortable situations. Lord, push us into them for the sake of people who need to hear. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a happy Independence Day today.